to appear in your presence and to give, to offer the worship that is due to your name, that you might be exalted above all, that you, O God, would have all of the glory and honor and praise uh, among us. And so we ask that, that you would work uh, in our midst, uh, setting forth Christ and him crucified before us as a great king, as a redeemer and savior of your people. Grant that we would be discontent outside of the refuge which he provides, that we might be hid in the, the rock, that we might take our shelter, knowing that underneath are the everlasting arms. Grant that we would be buoyed up then by your grace and give to us the outpouring of your Holy Spirit and all that uh, we are about in these uh, holy ordinances. Uh, we plead for the manifestation of your presence among us. We have come here this day to meet with you, the God of heaven, to catch a glimpse of your splendor, to behold our God. And grant that it would be so that in all of our praise, that our eyes might be directed uh, through the veil into the very throne room, into the Holy of Holies, where we behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we plead, O Lord, that you would give to us that spirit of brokenness and humility and contrition, which you will not despise, uh, which you delight in and reward. Uh, we come asking, O oh God, that we would be given help to humble ourselves in repentance before you. We confess that, uh, that we uh, have known the realities of original sin, we sinned in Adam from the beginning, that we were conceived in sin in our mother's wombs, and that we came forth uh, in our very breath, uh, with our first breath, uh, with sin in dominating our, our nature, and we have gone astray. And even those who have been redeemed by your grace, uh, we continue to uh, depart from the ways of light and of truth, and of fidelity, and of service and obedience to you. And so, Lord, we confess the sins of our fathers before us, which we have shared in. We confess our own sins, acknowledging that we have been lifted up when we ought to have been brought low, that we have thought too highly of ourselves, uh, that we have not uh, humbled ourselves uh, before you, uh, that we have too often gone idly, mindlessly, uh, through the outward form and routine of even holy things and worship in private and family and in the public assembly. We confess that we have dealt carelessly uh, with your ordinances. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, that we have uh, been led away into unbelief, not taking confidence in your word, not living upon your promises, not, uh, not conducting ourselves upon the platform of your divine truth. And we acknowledge that in many other things we have sinned against your holy name and turned from your holy word and have filled ourselves with defilement and unholiness before you. And so we confess these sins. We pray that you would help us from the depths of our hearts to acknowledge, uh, to own, uh, to bewail, and to forsake the sins which stick fast to us. Uh, we do believe. Help thou uh, our unbelief. And strengthen, O Lord, that which remains, and cause us to go forth from strength to strength uh, in the grace of the gospel. Uh, teach us, O Lord, to live upon those noble, uh, those heavenly, those liberating truths that are found for those who have been led into the liberty of your, of your gospel grace. How thankful we are that your people those struggling with indwelling sin, which is, remains present with us, how we can rejoice that we have been delivered from the grip, the domination, the power and tyranny of the devil, that we have been transferred from his kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your own beloved son, and that we walk as free men, sons and daughters of the living God, that we know fellowship with you, the triune God of heaven, that we know what it means to say, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation day and night. We delight in it after the inward man. 
How thankful we are that you have given to us uh, the fruits of your Spirit, uh, including joy, uh, giving us uh, the garment of, of, of joy and causing us to know the joy of the Lord, uh, which is our, our strength, the joy that is inexpressible, unspeakable, and full of glory. We thank you that you sustain and strengthen us in this earth, earthly pilgrimage, causing us to sip from the cup of blessing in anticipation of sitting down with you and with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of our Father, where we will feast with you uh, in, in unhindered joy, sinless joy for all of, of eternity. And so grant us your, your blessing. Bless us uh, as a congregation in this season in which you have brought us low, in which you have taught us to, to mourn uh, before you, where you have taught us that blessed are those who mourn, for they shall indeed uh, be comforted. Uh, we pray that you would give uh, to us the ministry of the Holy Spirit to work powerfully, irresistibly, efficaciously in the souls gathered here. Uh, we plead for the unconverted, that even in the face of these heavenly realities of church censure and the pronouncement of the same, uh, that you would awaken them to the terror of sin and to the terror of an eternal punishment uh, which is given to those who die outside of the Lord Jesus. Grant that they would see their need more than ever before uh, to be found in him. And bless your people and grant, O oh Lord, that our hearts would be kept in the fear of God and in the joy of the Holy Ghost. Uh, grant that we would keep our hearts with all diligence, that we would walk before you in godly fear. Uh, grant unto us, O oh Lord, a sense and the clear presence of your own glory uh, among us and all that we are doing. And we plead that you would continue to, to deal with us in mercy, uh, that you would deliver your people from the snares of the devil, uh, that you would raise up a standard against him when he comes in like a flood, that you would not lead us into temptation, uh, that we would uh, be careful uh, lest we ourselves fall. Uh, we ask that you would sanctify to us all of the temporal and spiritual trials which we face, uh, that these things would be instruments of good, bringing, though with them, uh, bitterness, that they would be, in fact, filled with much comfort and, and encouragement and strength, and that whether it be in the physical afflictions of, of this life or in the spiritual battles that we wage, that you would make all things to work together for the good of those who are called according to your uh, purpose. And we plead, O oh Lord, that you would bring about the advance of, of your cause in our midst, that just as in the days of the apostles, that so your word might go forth with strength, and that we might see uh, those added to the church daily uh, who believe, that you would be pleased to build up the cause of Christ, that you would uh, recover and strengthen that which is, is weak. We pray for ourselves, the churches of our Presbyterian denomination, as well as our, our sister churches and other uh, Reformed denominations, grant, Lord, that you would use uh, your church as a city set upon a hill, uh, that, you would, that you would cause it to persevere uh, in the midst of, of a dark generation, that the gates of hell would not prevail uh, against it. Multiply uh, your favor and lift up the light of your countenance and extend the borders of your tent and cause your word to go forth and to have free course and be glorified on this Sabbath day. Uh, we plead as well, O Lord, that you would continue to, to own all of the deliberations and actions of our own General Assembly, uh, which met this past week. We ask, O God, that you would keep us in the hollow of your hand, that you would carry us forward, bless the missionary enterprise in which we are engaged, and may we be enabled to take and to preach the gospel unto every creature under heaven, discipling the nations after all that you have commanded us. And we ask that you would encourage and strengthen us in this, in this monumentous labor, which we undertake with the promise that Christ would be with us always, uh, even to the end of the age. Uh, we plead, O oh Lord, that you would Grant us then help as we take up into our lips uh, the songs of Zion, the Lord's song, 
And as we sing your praise and bring ourselves under uh, the reverent hearing, conscible hearing of your word and the preaching of your word, grant that you would add your blessing to all of this, making it abundantly fruitful uh, among us. And so we commit ourselves. We confess, O Lord, that we are dependent upon you. We cast ourselves like little children uh, before our heavenly Father and pray that you would visit us for good. And we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We come in our singing through the Psalms to Psalm 31. We'll begin with verse 13 and sing through verse 18. The tune is Eden, number 55, which is the tune that we've been learning throughout the month of May. Psalm 31, verses 13 to 18. In verse 14, we sing, But as for me, O Lord, my trust upon thee I did lay. And I to thee, thou art my God, did confidently say, My times are wholly in thine hand. Do thou deliver me from their hands that mine enemies and persecutors be. Sing together Psalm 31, verses 13 to 18.
worship God now in the reading of his word. I'll ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Leviticus. We'll read together from chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20, beginning our reading at verse 1. Let's give careful and reverent attention to this, the word of God. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man, and will cut him off from among his people, because he hath given of his seed unto Molech, to defile my sanctuary, and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do any ways hide their eyes from the man, when he giveth of his seed unto Molech, and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family, and will cut him off, and all that go a whoring after him, to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits, and after wizards to go a whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul, and will cut him off from among his people. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy. For I am the Lord your God, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. For every one that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother, his blood shall be upon him. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And the man that lieth with his father's wife, that uncovereth his father's nakedness, both of them shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion, their blood shall be upon them. If a man also lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death their blood shall be upon them. And if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall slay the beast. And if a woman approach unto any beast and lie down there too, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness, and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing. They shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He hath uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear his iniquity. And if a man shall lie with a woman having her sickness, and shall uncover her nakedness, he hath discovered her fountain, and she hath uncovered the fountain of her blood, both of them shall be cut off from among their people. And thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, nor of thy father's sister, for he uncovereth his near kin. They shall bear their iniquity. And if a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, he hath uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin. They shall die childless. And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. Ye shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them, that the land whither I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. And ye shall not walk in the manner of the nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which hath separated you from other people. Ye shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean, and between unclean fowls and clean. And ye shall not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl, or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And ye shall be holy unto me, 
For I, the Lord, am holy, and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. A man also, or a woman, that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. And to his name be all the praise and the glory. Turn back with me in your Psalter to Psalm 31. We'll sing the remainder of the psalm, beginning at verse 19 and singing through verse 24. Psalm 31, beginning at verse 19 to the end, the tune is St. Lawrence, which is tune number 117. In verse 21, we, say all, we sing, All praise and thanks be to the Lord, for he hath magnified his wondrous love to me within a city fortified. So there's God's love for us. And then there's our reciprocation of that love in verse 23. O oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints, because the Lord doth guard the faithful, and he plenteously proud doers doth reward. We love him because he first loved us. Let's sing together verse 19 to the end. Again, in the reading of God's Word, this time in the New Testament, to 
First uh, Corinthians uh, chapter 5. So if you'll take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to 1 Corinthians. We'll read together chapter 5. Listen to what God says. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together into my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Amen. May God bless his holy word. We'll be taking a break from our exposition of the book of Titus this morning in order to draw aside and focus our attention on this portion from 1 Corinthians. Our text this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, or chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. We'll be taking up with the Lord's help. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 4 and 5. The theme is the ordinance of excommunication. We read there, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together into my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. As those who are gathered this morning, you will be well aware of the responsibilities that fall to us in this service, Uh, the pronouncement of the censure of excommunication regarding two who have in time past uh, dwelt among us as a brother and as a sister. And so it is my duty before God, as a minister of the gospel, uh, to instruct you from the Holy Scriptures uh, regarding this ordinance of censure, so that the pronouncement is backed by the authority of God's Word, where we are able to explicate and to make clear the nature of the ordinance and of all that is transpiring in that ordinance and the warrant for taking it up. As many of you will know, we have begun last month or so a series of sermons 
on the doctrine of church discipline, and we've covered uh, some ground already establishing the biblical basis for church discipline as a divine ordinance. Uh, We've looked at things like the love of God expressed in the chastening of his people. We've considered together the purposes of church discipline that the Lord makes clear in his word. And none of these things do I intend to review. Trust that these things are already in your heart and mind and provide some background for this particular censure, this particular act of discipline, that of greater excommunication. So here we are, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and scandal and unrepentant sin has broken out in their midst, and he rebukes them. Paul rebukes the Corinthian church for their failure, for their failure to implement the ordinances of Christ, their failure to excommunicate uh, this scandalous and obstinate individual. Reminds us of what we read Jesus saying in Revelation 2 and 3, where he addresses the seven churches of Asia and also rebukes them for allowing unrepentant sin of a scandalous nature to go unchecked uh, without a discipline. And the Lord threatens them corporately with chastening. Uh, for their refusal to do so, just as we see in the Old Testament law, the Lord threatening uh, corporate chastening for the refusal to deal as God has commanded us with those who are visibly wicked. And so we're taking up this theme of the ordinance of excommunication, what we often refer to as greater excommunication. This is the highest, the most severe censure that Christ has given uh, to his, his church. And you can see almost immediately what it entails, the word excommunication. If you break it apart, you have the word communication, same word as communion or fellowship. And so the word excommunication means to disfellowship or to put out of fellowship uh, an individual. They're put out of fellowship with God, and they're put out of, consequently, fellowship or communion with his people, all of the privileges that fall to them, as we'll soon see. And so it is an act, the censure is an act of of church discipline, to excommunicate a person who has formally professed faith in the Lord Jesus. We're going to look at three things focusing primarily on verses 4 and 5, but also bringing some help from other portions of God's Word. First of all, we see the authority of excommunication. First of all, the authority of excommunication. The origin or the source of discipline must be traced back to Christ. It must be traced back to Christ himself. It is Christ who is carrying out the discipline. It is God himself who is disciplining an individual through the means or the instruments of his representation, the officers of his church. And so Paul says in verse 4 that this is being affected in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and with the power or the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see this same uh, wording used elsewhere in reference to discipline. In 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, uh, we see him saying in verse 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. And so it is Christ. And that, that highlights the fact that discipline is ministerial. It is, it is not uh, individuals acting magisterially as lords and as kings, but as servants under the Lord, serving his people and serving Christ himself. Christ is the one acting. Notice that Christ is the one present in this ordinance. You go back to Matthew chapter 18, where Jesus is laying out some of the requirements of, of church discipline. 
he concludes, having spoken about the process that is to take place and all of the spiritual ramifications associated with it, it's in that context of discipline that we find the well-known words in verse 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That verse was originally set in the context of discipline, where God's people are gathered together in his name. Christ is in the midst of them. His presence is manifest in in this ordinance. And so it is sober for us. It is sober chiefly because when this ordinance is carried out in accord with the prescriptions and word of of God, it is God himself who is at work. We're taught that we should confess that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is God's hand. It is Christ who is working. And thus we are obligated and encouraged to obey him. And we are warned against disobeying him. We spoke on Wednesday evening several weeks ago about the fact that this is one of the marks, the faithful administration of discipline is one of the marks of the true church. And it has, therefore, an obligation that falls to us as as a result. Think about this in terms of other ordinances where we see Christ's presence. When God's word is, is preached faithfully, Christ is present in the ordinance of preaching so that God's sheep hear the voice of the shepherd and follow him, the passage says. He commends the Thessalonians, you didn't receive our word merely as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the very word of God. Christ is speaking through the faithful preaching of his word. The same thing is true in the sacrament of of the supper and baptism. And we, we often highlight this in the supper. Christ is spiritually present, and we are by faith feeding upon the Lord Jesus Christ, who is offering himself to us. And so it is with this ordinance as well. But it also points us to the fact that we are dealing with heavenly realities. If, if it is Christ's authority, Christ's name, Christ's presence, there are heavenly realities that are taking place. We're not just going through administrative forms where a person is removed for a communion role, where a person is no longer a member of the church. It's not merely a human ordinance or an administrative exercise that we're engaged in. Things are taking place in the spiritual realm. Things are, transactions are unfolding with the souls of men in heaven itself before the all-seeing eye of God. And this is why Jesus says in that passage we referred to a moment ago, in Matthew 18, verse 18, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And this beckons back to the same sort of wording a couple chapters earlier in chapter 16 and verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. These are heavenly transactions which are taking place before the Lord. Now, it's interesting because this same individual in 1 Corinthians 5 who's excommunicated in the name and with the authority of the Lord Jesus ends up being recovered, as many of you will know, and there's reference made to him in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. But I want you to notice here in terms of dealing with heavenly realities that in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 10, it's brought out on the other side, the side of absolution and restoration as well. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. So the point is that there are heavenly realities. We are merely confirming outwardly what is determined in heaven itself. And there have been times, as you see in the same epistle in chapter 11, when the church had failed to carry out their responsibilities in church discipline. 
that Christ broke into their midst and carried it out himself. You go back and look at 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 and following, when he says, I visited you with sickness and death because you would not judge yourselves. And therefore, he, he, he calls upon them to judge themselves lest they are condemned with the world. And so the authority of excommunication is rooted in Christ's authority as the king and head of his church. And there are things taking place that are more real than the reality of being able to touch our own hands and see with our own eyes. God is at work in carrying these things out. It's a permanent ordinance for the church. There have been some who want to say, well, this, this, what's described in 1 Corinthians 5, was unique to the apostolic office and the apostolic authority. And there have been some, the most extreme form of this is in Rome, where the pontiff, the man of sin, claims for himself the right in his, with his own authority to damn souls and to take them out of purgatory into heaven by canonizing them and other satanic delusions and false doctrines. But it's also taken lesser forms. Is this unique and confined to the apostolic authority or in the case of Rome, their idea of the succession of that authority to the bishop of Rome? No. It would make utter nonsense of the passage because Paul is faulting them, faulting Corinth for their refusal to excommunicate this person. He says it fell to you and you haven't done it. And he's chastening them. And so it did not, it was not unique to the apostolic office. And as I've already proved on Wednesday night, it is a permanent ordinance for the church. And it's one that takes place within the corporate church itself. In verse 4, you'll notice that other phrase where it says, when ye are gathered together. When ye are gathered together. What's happening is happening in the realm of the church. It is a corporate function, an ordinance that belongs to the whole church. You see examples of this in the Old Testament. There were civil punishments and there were ecclesiastical censures. And they were distinct from one another in the Old Testament. People could be put out of the synagogue and they could be removed from the camp and they could be in the civil realm. Ex they could be executed. But it was the, the entire body of Israel was involved in such things. The whole of God's people participated, whether it was civil or ecclesiastical, in those ordinances. And the same is here as well. In Matthew 18, Jesus says, take it to the church. And here he's referring to the, the elders, but it falls within the corporate church as a whole. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul highlights this in his instructions to this young minister when he says in verse 20, them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. And so this is an ordinance which takes place when the church is gathered together. It's a public ordinance, not done in secret, not done in a closet, not hidden from the eyes of men, but carried out in the authority and name of Christ within his church. Secondly, we see alien the alienation of excommunication. Secondly, the alienation of excommunication. Turn your attention to verse 5. To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now this involves several things. Let me highlight them for you. It involves, first of all, being cast out of the kingdom. It involves being cast out of the kingdom. When a person professes faith in the Lord Jesus, they and their household are taken from the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of Christ and of God's beloved Son. And when those who turn unrepentant and turn from Christ, forsaking Christ, they turn from Christ back to Satan, to the kingdom of darkness. And this isn't this language isn't only found here. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, we see the same thing in verse 20. 
of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And so they're being spiritually handed over to Satan by Christ. And Satan, they, they, we have the unleashed influence of Satan brought to bear upon them. And so it's being, first of all, cast out of the kingdom. Now let me just reinforce this by the context. In verse 2, it's described this way, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. You see that? And then again in verse 13, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Again, verse 7, purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Jesus says in, in Matthew 18, verse 17, that the person who is cast out of the church is to be considered a heathen and a publican. Not a Christian, not an erring Christian, not a backslidden believer, but they are to be considered as one outside the pale of the covenant and of the church and of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. They're to be considered and thought of as a heathen and as a publican. 1 John 2, they, they go out from among you because they were not of you. And thus it is manifest that they were not of you. And so there is a breach of fellowship being delivered unto Satan, being delivered, cast out of, of the church of the Lord Jesus and confined to the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of darkness. And this brings with it a breach of fellowship with God's people. So that in verse 11, he says, listen, you're not to keep company with them. He says at the end of the verse, with such a one, no, not to eat. There's a breach in the fellowship with God's people. And this comes out in lots of places. Titus 3, verse 10, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject there to be Rejected, the passage says. In 2 Thessalonians, uh, chat, we already read uh, chapter 3, verse 6. Same thing in verse 14. And if a man obey not our word by this epistle, note, that is mark, identify, hang a sign, if you will, around that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Likewise, Romans 16, verse 17 now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. And avoid them. And so there is a breach, and there is to be no familiar fellowship with them. It's interesting that when Paul is referring back in 2 Corinthians 2, when he's referring back to this act of excommunication, he refers to it, in chapter 2, and verse 5, this, or verse 6, sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. There was a corporate responsibility that fell to the congregation of God's people. It was a punishment inflicted of, of many. And so following on the heels of Jesus' words that they are to be considered a heathen and a publican. You're to think of them and to treat them as an unbeliever and not to act as if all is well. You say, well, what, what does this mean? It means that we don't have fellowship, we don't hang out with, we don't engage in, in uh, recreation, we don't engage in uh, other uh, informal activities like that. When we have opportunity uh, to, to speak to these people, to communicate to them, even in, in writing or face-to-face, uh, -face, we're to make clear that they need to repent. And our conversation is to be confined to those sorts of things. And so you can picture yourself you know, meeting someone who's been excommunicated in the store, and they might say hello, and you might say hello, and you might say to them, well, you know, I want to encourage you that we're sinners and that there's a savior and we have to turn to him and repent and flee to christ and they might interrupt you and say what 
What are you doing? You're trying to evangelize me? And you would have to say, yes, I am. I'm trying to bring home the gospel to you. To which they might reply, well, the church, may have, I may have been cast out of the church, but I'm still a Christian. And you would have to reply and say, I'm afraid not. All of your actions are contrary to a true profession of faith. And therefore, because you refuse to obey Christ's word and to walk in accord with his truth, there's no reason for me to believe that you're a Christian. And therefore, I'm calling you to repent and to flee prior to the wrath uh, to come. We're not to have fellowship with them. This is reinforced everywhere, Old and New Testament. One thinks of 2 Corinthians 6, where it says in verse 15, And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my, my people." There's a temptation because of cowardice, unbelief, awkwardness, and many other things to send mixed signals and to cloud the reality. As we've already noted, what's taking place, Christ is doing. It's out of our hands in many ways, and it is a heavenly reality. And we cannot, as it were, ignore these heavenly realities. We have to, to face them. But that also means that they're excluded from all of the privileges and promises which fall to the church of the Lord Jesus. The promises that are given to the church are not theirs. The privileges which are given to the church by Christ are not theirs. They cannot marry within the church. They cannot give their children to the administration of baptism. They're cut off from the covenant. And this comes with monumentous implications because God has provided for those within the external administration of his covenant and within the visible church a truckload of blessings, protection, and many, many points of, of privilege for us. And that includes everyone that is found within the household of God, both believers and their children baptized in the triune name of God. The Lord is pleased to provide for them spiritual protection, physical protection, to provide for them all sorts of, of, uh, of ways in which a shield would, would defend them. And that includes even unconverted children, baptized children within Christian families, Remember, not only was believing Noah saved, but all of his household, his children, were included in the protection, the shield that God provided for Noah against the torrent of his judgment upon a wicked nation. And so there are many benefits that, that come uh, to the people of God and to uh, their, their households. This is removed. This is removed. It's interesting. I'm not going to take the time, but there are a dozen places in the Old Testament referring not to civil censure. I read purposely Leviticus 20, which is dealing primarily with civil censure because it reinforces the gravity of the sins we're discussing, how God views them, and how we are to emote and think uh, about them. But there are over a dozen places in which we have descriptions of ecclesiastical censure within the Old Testament. And it uses this language of them being taken out from the midst of you, as we see in this passage here in, chapter, in verse 2 and verse 13. Same sort of language. They're taken out from the midst. All of the blessings and privileges given uh, to the people of God is ripped away from them. And now they're exposed. They've been handed over, given over to Satan. And they no longer have any of that consolation. But chiefly, what does this have to do with? It is a breach of fellowship with God himself. This is ultimately what's happening. There's a breach in fellowship with God, which corresponds to the breach in fellowship with his people and the breach in terms of all the privileges that fall to his people. 
the Lord can no longer say to them, I am your refuge and your strength, an ever-present help in trouble. The Lord gives them no promise of his protection. The Lord's people know even angelic ministry. Hebrews 1, the end, speaks about their ministering spirits which serve the Lord's people. We see references to it everywhere. Even the children reference to their angels. We have Lazarus, the angels, take his soul into the bosom of of Abraham. The angels are God's servants to carry out his holy will. The angelic ministry is gone. The excommunicated are stripped of these, these blessings. And it's tantamount to saying this. When he says, I've given them over to Satan, he's saying, I'm giving them over, and they have no defense in body or soul against the devil. They have no defense. It is not It is no longer said that they are the apple of mine eye. The first example of excommunication that we find in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 4 in reference to Cain. And there are some grave words there. In verse 11, And now art thou cursed from the earth, which have opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her, her strength. A refuge and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. And then listen to these words, because this underlines what I'm saying. And from thy face shall I be hid. And from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. This is what is being described. The Lord says of his people in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 18 that the wicked one cannot touch him. The wicked one cannot touch God's people. That he defends us. When the enemy comes in like a flood, he raises up a standard against him. This is removed. They are given over to Satan and it can no longer be said The wicked one cannot touch him. He goes on to say, To deliver such a one unto unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. The destruction of the flesh. All of the calamities that are attached to the kingdom of the devil are theirs. They are a slave, not free not liberated, but they abide under the bondage and tyranny of the wicked one. It is his realm that is their abode. It is his reign that they are subjected to. It is his tyranny that they suffer under. And Satan is, as if you will, Satan is let loose. He is let loose upon them. And they are exposed outwardly, and they are exposed inwardly to all of the torments that the devil is pleased to bring. One of the things that this does is it communicates in the most graphic and sobering terms that without repentance, this and more are your eternal lot. It is giving the excommunicated a foretaste, a foretaste of what is to come for those who refuse to repent of their sins. Because on the last day, there will be destruction without remedy. And so they are caused to sip at God's own hand from this bitter cup in order that they might profit from it. So when he says to deliver such a one for the destruction of the flesh, their body and soul are subjected to his reign and his kingdom. 
This is a judicial act, a judicial act of God, a verdict that is being passed. The fact is God will not be mocked. God's glory will not be impugned. What you sow, you will surely reap. My friends, I trust that this sinks down into the depths of your very souls. What you sow, you shall surely reap. God will not give his glory to be trampled under the feet of wicked men. And God will not give his church to be polluted with the defilement of unrepentant sin. The leaven will leaven the whole lump if the leaven is not removed. And so the Lord says, purge out the leaven in order that his church might be maintained in the purity of its gospel testimony and faithfulness to the Lord. There is alienation, the alienation of excommunication. What is the appropriate response of this alienation on behalf of the church? In a word, the appropriate response is to mourn. That's what the text says. Look at verse 2. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned. The appropriate response is that of, of mourning. There is in many ways a parallel to what we experience in a funeral where we mourn the loss of a loved one who has been taken away from among us out of this world. These are taken away from the midst of us, put away from us. Something like a spiritual funeral. And it is to be accompanied with sanctified and holy mourning. We are to exhibit what the father of the prodigal son exhibited. The father mourned over the prodigal. It is a solemn, it is a solemn occurrence. But my friends, it, there's blessing even in the morning. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. If we are mourning biblically, appropriately, spiritually, we're mourning for the right things. God promises to make it a condition of blessing for us. And it is the opportunity for, for us to search our hearts. If you look at Acts 5, where the Lord brings not only spiritual but temporal judgment upon Ananias and Sapphira, the response is telling. Because in verse 11 it says, And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. There is a godly fear that ought to be ought to be struck deep into our very souls, where we are taught that our God is a consuming fire, that when we come to the public worship of God and sit under the preaching, it is no trifle. And what we do in response to that word, either receiving it with faith or unbelief, and whether we persevere by God's grace, walking in his word, not only being hearers or doers, is no trifle. God is in the midst of us, and he is working his holy will. And our souls hang in the balance, and heaven and earth is being set. Heaven and hell is being set before us. And we ought to be searching our hearts with contrition for our own sin in light of these things. Facing reality of where sin that is unmortified leads and what the result will be. No one starts off down that road thinking, about the end, where it all goes. So it is with you, every last one of you, entertaining sin, striking peace, a truce with sin. You think about the immediate gratification and fleeting pleasures that it brings, and you are not pondering with godly fear where that will lead. 
because it is one step after another, ultimately culminating in the highest censure of his church, greater excommunication, and without repentance, damnation in hell. We ought to search our hearts. But there's also some expectation that we receive from the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 7, Paul says in response to this, 1 Corinthians 5, you mourned. You sorrowed not as the world sorrows. You sorrowed with godly sorrow. And he then lists the fruitfulness that came from their mourning. He says you've had multiplied spiritual blessing to the entire church has come about. Everyone has profited. There's been, this has been a season of tremendous spiritual fruitfulness for the whole church in Corinth, he says, as well as for the recovery of the one who is excommunicated. You go back to that Acts 5 passage, it's, you'd think to yourself, well, the Lord breaking out in the midst of his church, striking people dead in the worship where they're carried out of the worship of God, Surely, this is the opposite of church growth, and it's true that it warned the unruly and ungodly. But go on to look further. It says in verse 13, on the one hand, and of the rest, durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. People were recognizing this is serious business. We can't be glib about membership in the church of Christ and attachment to his kingdom. But it goes on and it says, and believers were the more added to the church multitudes, both of men and women. The Lord brought about an explosion, if you will, of church growth through these means. Blessings that, humanly speaking, you would think it would result in the opposite. The Lord is getting honor and glory for himself in these ordinances. And so this, the alienation of excommunication, pondering the fact that they're cut off from God, cut off from the privileges that belong to the visible church, cut off from the fellowship of God's people, given over to the kingdom of Satan, Satan being let loose to torment them without any refuge and any hope in body and soul. All of these weighty things ought to lead us to mourn. And if we're not mourning, something is not right with our own hearts. Thirdly, we see the aim of excommunication. Thirdly, the aim of excommunication. Go back to our text, 1 Corinthians 5, second half of verse 5, that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. This is part of the aim that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In other words, we are not without hope. The word that is pointing to purpose, it's saying this is, this is part of the aim of, of excommunication. We saw it in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, which is the closest parallel to this passage. Speaking of Hymenaeus and Alexander, he says, whom I have delivered under Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And so the purpose was to humble them. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 32, he says, judge yourselves that you wouldn't be condemned with the world. And we know that there's hope because this was affected. This man who was excommunicated ended up being recovered and absolved and restored to the church. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 7 and 8 Verse 6, sufficient to, sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was afflicted of many, so that contrarywise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him, and so on. We are not without hope. The Lord may be pleased, according to his sovereign will, to use greater excommunication, delivering a person unto Satan for the destruction of their flesh. He may be pleased to use that in order to recover them, recover them to bring them to see the gravity of what they have done, to terrify them in conscience 
and in mind and in body with all that has taken place, to break them and humble them and to drive them by gospel repentance to the Lord Jesus. And so we can pray for their recovery, that God would be pleased to bring this to pass. There's sometimes confusion in this point. Because greater excommunication is not identical to the sin unto death, of which the Lord says, we cannot pray for such individuals. There's a difference between greater excommunication and, for example, the descriptions in Hebrews 6 and chapter 10 and so on. The confusion comes because they can overlap. A person who sinned the sin unto death, a person who's guilty of Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, can also be excommunicated. And so the same person can fall into both buckets. But it is not necessarily the case that a person who is excommunicated is equivalent to Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, 1 John, sin unto death category. It is not necessarily the case, and so there can be sometimes confusion on this. Here we're told that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. This man indeed was brought to repentance. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14, he's saying, don't have fellowship that they may be shamed. It's to humiliate them. I'm cut off from God and from the privileges of the church and fellowship of his people. What have I done? This is spiritual suicide. I have leapt, as it were, headlong into hell. And they're, therefore, they're to be brought to shame in these things. The Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, the Christian, while the Christian is not to hold fellowship, there are civil and familial responsibilities which remain intact, obligations and duties that you may have to a person because of a family tie, but nothing more, even in those circumstances. All fellowship is to be cut off. Loving the Lord Jesus Christ means at times hating father and mother, sister and brother, son and daughter. And allegiance to Jesus, supreme allegiance to Jesus, means at times being cut off from those who are near of kin to us. The Christian is still to show Christian kindness to everyone. It's no reason to physically abuse or disrespect uh, a person any more than we would anyone else. We're to deal in Christian temperance and, and kindness with them. But there is a breach. And the breach is healed through the means God has ordained. There are people who think, I'll smooth things over. I'll play nice. I'll kind of make it not so awkward and aggravated. And this will help build a bridge in order to somehow win them back, you have played the fool. You have sought an end through unbiblical means. That is not the means God has ordained through which they're to be recovered. The means through which they're to be recovered is God's way, and it is following the ordinances that God has ordained. Now, we recognize that this is all open to the sovereign disposal of, of God to do as he sees fit. 1 Timothy 5, verse 24, some men are open beforehand, going before to judgment. Some men they follow after. And the Lord may do various things through this ordinance. It gives them, no doubt, a foretaste of the judgment to come. And in some instances, it will harden the person in their sin. And the Lord is using it to heap judgment upon their head. The censure itself is used to harden them and to deepen and to, to further extend the fury of his wrath and judgment upon them. So for some it will harden them, for others it will heal them. They see, this is the torment I deserve, and therefore I must repent and go to the Lord. But God's ordinances, regardless of the outcome, whether to salvation or to damnation, just as in preaching, it's a savor of life unto life, and a savor of death unto death, 
So the, the, the ordinances of discipline are a savor of life unto life and a savor of death unto death. But God's ordinances must not be profaned or defiled. We must not expose the gospel to contempt. And we must be conscious that a little, little leaven does indeed leaven the whole lump. In Hebrews 12, verse 15, he says, speaking about the root of bitterness, which springs up, he says, by which many may be defiled. Many are defiled. We've noted this already. I preached a whole sermon on the purposes of discipline in which we flesh some of these things out in more detail. It is to deter wickedness among God's people. You see it in the Old Testament as well. Deuteronomy 13, 11, and all Israel shall hear and fear and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. It deters the people of God, the professing people of God, from such sins. So the prodigal is brought to his senses. And what happens? He, he's brought to the end in the pig trough when he would fain have eaten the pig's, the swine's husk. He remembers his father's house and he returns. He's left the father's house, alienated. He remembers it in that slough and returns. Paul is saying it may be that God will be pleased, though they suffer under severe spiritual chastisements, that in the end, the spirit may be saved. In the last day, in the day, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see something of the aim of excommunication. We are not without hope. We can earnestly wait upon the Lord that their spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so here we see something of the nature of this ordinance of greater excommunication. We see the realities that are involved in it. We see all of the implications, both for the individuals that are excommunicated as well as for the people of God as a whole. We see the purposes that God intends in it. And all of this is is grave. And all of this is sober. And in some ways it chills us, sending tingles up and down our spine when we have to face the music of all that we are engaged in. And yet we do so not after the wisdom of men, but with confidence, with faith, with obedience to the word of God and the wisdom of God, that he might have all of the glory and honor and praise among us. May the Lord help us as we meditate upon these things. We come now to the pronouncement of of censure. We'll pray in just a moment. But first of all, we have, it's my responsibility to, to give you a narration of the, pro, the process that we have followed uh, to this point. We have the case of two individuals Miss Sarah Cochran and Mr. Josiah Dalella. These two cases are completely independent of one another. There's no connection whatsoever other than the fact that in God's providence, the cause of discipline unfolded around the same period of time within the life of our church. And so back in the second half of 2012, we became aware that these individuals had fallen into uh, grievous and scandalous instances of violating the seventh commandment. They both appeared before the session, and they were admonished and challenged, and both of them acknowledged that they were unrepentant in their actions. The session went through the process associated with the suspension from Sacramental privileges, you'll remember, none of this is done in a corner. None of this is done in secret or in a closet somewhere. Uh, You'll have participated in these 
uh, public ordinances. So they were suspended from sacramental privileges for a year. During that year, we sought to admonish them and call them to repentance. We prayed for them, and we sought their good. And yet, all of those admonitions were fruitless. And so we were obligated to the Lord because of his word to raise the censure to greater excommunication, which brings us to where we are this morning. That too included a process, you'll remember. Uh, There were three weeks in which public admonition was made as we neared the time. That was followed by three Sabbaths devoted to solemn public prayer for them. At the same time, the Presbytery met on three occasions and devoted themselves to public prayer for these individuals. Many of you have prayed for them in private and in your family worship. We have remembered them in prayer, in the prayer meeting, and in our public assemblies. And in all of this, we have been slow, exceedingly slow, and exceedingly tender, and exceedingly desirous of seeing them wooed back to the Lord Jesus, to repent and to flee to him for hope and for refuge. And while their guilt in the sins in which they have participated were great, they have been made much, much greater. They have been, the guilt has been made significantly heavier by their refusal in the face of all of the tenderness and in the face of all of these admonitions to persist obstinately and impenitently in their sin. They have aggravated the weight of their guilt. And so it is incumbent upon us in obedience to Christ, whom we ourselves fear, uh, to take up this, this holy ordinance under Christ's hand. The Presbytery met the last time after all of the rest of the steps had been fulfilled, and they instructed me on this Sabbath and in this service uh, to proceed to the pronouncement of this most solemn censure of greater excommunication. And so let us turn then and seek the face of the Almighty for his help and favor in these things. Let's stand together for prayer. Almighty endeavor, blessed God in heaven, you are the righteous one. You are the Lord, and you change not, the eternal God. And we confess that you are a consuming fire, that we must serve you with fear, that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, that you do not wink at sin, that you do not allow yourself to be mocked, but that you, O Lord, pursue. We acknowledge that you have given to us in your word these ordinances of church censure and of this greater excommunication. And so we come humbly, believingly, dependently to receive the ordinances given and to carry them out in your own name and with your own authority. And we do plead that promise that Christ gave, that where two or three are gathered in his name, that he would be in the midst of us. Grant, O Almighty God, that the presence, that that your presence would be seen and known and felt, the fruitfulness of it would be worked out in the souls of, of your people. We commend unto you these two souls. We remember, O Lord, with sorrow now as they at one time went up to the house of God with us, enjoyed in doing so, sat with us at the sacrament table, sipped from the same cup, fed from the same loaf, and who have now gone out from among us and turned their faces away from Christ and your word and gospel and have rather embraced 
sin and all of its ugliness. We plead, O Lord, for their repentance. Break them and grant that they would be driven by that good, living way to the Lord Jesus. We commend them, soul and body, unto you. We ask, O Lord, that thou wouldst be pleased to sanctify these things to us, that we ourselves might fear, that we might remember our own weakness, lest we also fall, that we might keep our hearts and pursue holiness and hide in the refuge of Christ all our days. So, Lord, grant your blessing to all that we're about, we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. We now come to the pronouncement of censure. The Kirk Session of the Greenville Congregation of the Free Church of Scotland continuing. Having found Miss Sarah Cochran guilty of the charge of multiple instances of scandalously breaching the Seventh Commandment, and persisting, obstinate, and impenitent in her sin, despite tender admonitions and the Lord's previous censure of suspension from sacramental privileges. And Presbytery, having reviewed this matter and instructed me as a minister of the gospel to proceed to the pronouncement of this dreadful sentence, Therefore, in the name and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only head and king of the church, I do solemnly pronounce and declare Miss Sarah Cochran excommunicated and shut out from the fellowship with Christ and from all the privileges promised to his church and delivered unto Satan. She is therefore to be accounted by you as a heathen and a publican. According to the command of Christ, who says that whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Likewise, the Kirk session of the Greenville Congregation of the Free Church of Scotland continuing, having found Mr. Josiah Delella guilty of the charge of multiple instances of scandalously breaching the seventh commandment and persisting, obstinate, and impenitent in his sin, despite tender admonitions and the Lord's previous censure of suspension from sacramental privileges, and Presbytery having reviewed this matter and instructed me as a minister of the gospel to proceed to the pronouncement of this dreadful sentence. Therefore, in the name and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only head and king of the church, I do solemnly pronounce and declare Mr. Josiah Delella excommunicated and shut out from fellowship with Christ and from all the privileges promised to his church and delivered unto Satan. He is therefore to be accounted by you as a heathen and a publican, according to the command of Christ, who says that whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. May God bless this ordinance to his own glory, to the mercy of these people. It also falls to me then to carry out my duty and responsibility of bringing a warning to the congregation. I've already highlighted for you in the preaching of God's word your responsibility to Miss Cochran and Mr. Delella, the nature of your relationship to them, the obligations that you have with regards to them. I would merely add that you might commend them earnestly to the Lord in your prayers and that you might wait upon the Lord 
that he might be pleased to restore them yet again to us under his blessing. But in the meantime, your relationship to them has been altered and remains altered until such a time as they repent and are absolved of their sin. And your, the way in which you think about them and speak to them and relate to them must reflect what the word of God requires of us. And calling them to repentance and begging them to consider the claims of the gospel and the mercy that is offered freely in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's also a responsibility that we have individually before the Lord. These individuals have lost their way. You see something of the, the subtlety of Satan. These things do not happen overnight. These things do not happen, as it were, in a split instant. The devil is subtle. And he comes skillfully, deceptively, gradually, working in the hearts of those who have some attachment to his church. Bible reading is left off for more pressing concerns. The prayer closet is neglected. Family worship is intermittent. Attendance at all of the assemblies of public worship are abandoned or only attended from time to time. A person begins to entertain sin and to gradually give way to greater and greater expressions and outbreaks of that sin. There's a warning. We must keep our hearts with all diligence, out of which flow the issues of life. We must watch our hearts. We need to be careful that we be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, that we resist the devil in order that he might flee from us, that we might pray that the Lord would not lead us into temptation. We are dealing with sober and serious matters, and you will have committed a very grievous error if you take all of these things and push them in your minds and think, well, this only belongs to someone else. Every single individual here must heed the warnings of God's word and profit from the ordinances of God's word. For those who have not professed faith, it ought to be a spur to see how desperately you need a refuge in Jesus. For the Christian, it ought to be an incentive to the pursuit of holiness and a determent from the entertainment of sin. But it also reminds us of our obligations to one another, doesn't it? We are responsible to exhort one another daily, lest through the deceitfulness of sin our hearts be hardened. You have a mutual obligation to one another to not only watch your soul, but to watch the souls of everyone else gathered here, to inquire, to pursue. And the words of Hebrews tend to study one another. to listen to conversations, attitudes, and actions, and to exhort one another. There's no Lone Ranger Christians within biblical Christianity. No one gets to heaven pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps. The Lord uses the corporate church for the individual good of all of his people, and so we have an obligation to one another. And lastly, we have an obligation to humble ourselves. We have sinned ourselves, not in the same way, perhaps, not to the same degree or in the same heinous expressions, but sin is found within, and we must humble ourselves. And this is an appropriate time for us to devote ourselves to repentance, to repentance for our own sin, to repentance even in terms of the failures the obligations that we bore to these two individuals. 
in the ways in which perhaps we failed in caring for them. Surely that's the case. Surely it's the case in reference to all of our relationships with those that are here and others that we know. And so we must humble ourselves under the hand of God. But we also, coupled with this, must exalt in the glory of God. It is a happy thing to see God's name vindicated. It is a good thing to see God's glory preserved. It is a precious thing to see the purity of his gospel maintained. It is a good thing to see his church obeying and doing what he has required of us. To the degree that God is pleased to get glory for himself, to that degree we rejoice in it, so that our sorrow and our joy are mixed together before the Lord. May the Lord help us and may he sanctify all of these things to our spiritual and eternal good. Let's sing now from Psalm 94. Psalm 94, verses 11 to 15. Psalm 94, verses 11 to 15. The tune is Torwood. Tune number 140. I actually read this whole thing. I want it in your mind so that you're able to sing it with understanding. Man's thoughts to be but vanity, the Lord doth well discern. Blessed is the man thou chastenest, Lord, and makes thy law to learn, that thou mayest give him rest from days of sad adversity, until the pit be d digged for those that work iniquity. For sure the Lord will not cast off those that his people be, neither his own inheritance quit and forsake will he. But judgment unto righteousness shall yet return again, and all shall follow after it that are right-hearted men. I'll sing these words to tune number 140. Lord.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen.